time is a fundamental quantity which humans have always been interested in. And we use it to define the duration of events and the separation between them. Now in order to make sense of time, we as humans use clocks, and we have defined units of time, like the second or the hour. But the problem when thinking about time as we know it, in terms of clocks that we use, is that the clocks we use in everyday life are actually really quite complicated, and they don't keep very precise time. In order to gain some further understanding about what time is, fundamentally, we have to use the simplest kind of clock imaginable. Now, to design any clock, what you use is something which stays constant over time. In order to define a constant unit of time, we tend to use a physical constant. Now, historically, like you would find in a grandfather clock, say, this would be the period of a pendulum swinging. What we're going to use instead in our simple clock is something much, much more fundamental to the universe, the speed of light. To define our clock, we use a very simple piece of physics. We use the fact that the distance travelled by an object moving at a speed v is equal to that speed multiplied by the time that we observe it for. Or in other words, the x equals v times t. The basic idea for our clock, then, is that we take a known distance, say a, a one metre rod, and we time how long it takes for light, which has a fixed, definite, constant speed, to travel that length. To construct our clock, we place a light source at one end of our rod, like a, a torch or something, and a mirror at the other end. We see a light ray will propagate, or pass, from the light source to the mirror, it's reflected, goes back down the rod, and is detected somehow. The time taken to do this is our clock's defined unit of time. Obviously this is a pretty silly clock, it wouldn't be very much used in daily life, but it keeps exact, precise time. And we can work out what that unit of time is. It's the length of the rod, twice, so two metres, divided by the speed of light, so two over c. Now, let's say that both me and you own identical models of this clock. So we sit on a bench together, we observe each other's clocks, and we say that, yep, they keep exactly the same time. Both of our clocks, in other words, have exactly the same unit of time. I then sit with my clock on a bench on a station platform, and I watch as you get onto a train, and the train moves past me. I look at my clock, and it has exactly the same unit of time. You look at your clock, and it still has exactly the same unit of time. Now, this is where things get interesting, though. Let's say that I wanted to work out your clock's unit of time. If you recall, we defined a clock's unit of time as the time taken for a ray of light to get from one end of the rod to the other and back down again. The problem now is, though, that your clock, or your rod, is moving past me. So if we trace out the path that a ray of light takes, it's no longer vertical, it's a diagonal. If this is difficult to imagine, think of a person chucking a tennis ball in the air whilst sat on a train which is moving. To them, the tennis ball is moving up and down, no problem. But to somebody who's outside of the train, that ball traces out a parabolic trajectory. Going back to our light clocks, this is where the crucial part comes in. Because the thing about the speed of light is that it's a constant, but not any old constant. As can be worked out from the equations which describe light, which is actually an oscillation of electric and magnetic fields, the speed of light relative to you is constant, no matter how fast you're moving. So if you were to turn on a torch and measure how fast the light is streaming away from you, you would find the speed of light. However, if you were then to mount that torch on something and get in a car and drive away from the torch at 100 miles an hour and measure how fast the rays of light were streaming away from you then, you'd still find the speed of light. Exactly. The speed of light relative to you is always constant. And what this means for you and your clock on the train is bizarre. Because the light is moving at exactly the same speed relative to me as it always has done, but now the light has to travel further because of these diagonal paths, your clock's unit of time is longer than my clock's unit of time. Using basic algebra and Pythagoras' rule, we can establish exactly how much further it has to travel, and so exactly how much slower your clock is running. We conclude, then, that because your clock, which is identical to my clock, ha now has a longer unit of time than my stationary clock, the time itself is running slower for you on the moving train than it is for me. In other words, for any moving object, time, as perceived on that object, is slower than it is for a stationary object. We can see exactly how much slower, and we find that most of the time, it makes near as damn it no difference. Because look, we're dividing the 
speed of our object, which in this case was our train, by the speed of light squared. And the speed of light, in case you haven't noticed, is a really, really large number. And so we're multiplying our original unit of time for our clock, 2 over c, by this factor, which is almost exactly 1. But if we allow v to get really, really large, like really quite close to the speed of light, this factor gets big, like really, really, really big. So this process is a real process. It has been observed, it's been scientifically proven by experiments to occur. But in our everyday lives, because we typically don't move around anywhere near the speed of light, we just don't notice it. Going back to our original problem though, we could ask exactly the same question in reverse. Let's say that you on the train see me go past on the platform and want to work out my clock's unit of time. Because have you ever had that experience where you're sat on a train in a platform and there's another train next to you and something moves and you can't tell for a second whether it's your train moving or the train next to you moving? If you didn't have any other forms of reference or any form of friction, you genuinely wouldn't be able to tell. It would be impossible to tell. The laws of physics are exactly the same in moving reference frames as they are in stationary reference frames. So we could ask, Let's say that you're sat on a train and you think you're stationary, but the platform, somewhat bizarrely, is hurtling past you. You might then think that my clock is running slow compared to your clock, which has kept the same time all along. What we find then is that the only motion, the only speeds which are important to this problem, are those speeds which are relative. My speed relative to you, the train speed relative to me. As such, this all comes under special relativity. This is a physical phenomenon called time dilation, and it's one of many physical phenomena which occur in Einstein's theory of special relativity. I'm not going to talk any more about the subject in this video, because frankly it's long enough already. However, if you'd like to learn more about things like uh, length contraction, um, mass increase, um, the twins not actually a paradox, then I highly recommend you check out Richard Feynman's Six Easy Pieces, where there's a chapter about relativity. And if you liked that, then also his six not-so-easy pieces where he t starts to talk about general relativity. On the other hand, if you would like a more mathematical treatment of special relativity, I cannot recommend highly enough Rindler's An Introduction to Special Relativity and, once you've got a little bit past that, Relativity, his seminal textbook on the subject. I hope this video was interesting because to me this is one of the coolest things in physics. I owe this thought experiment to Richard Feynman, by the way, I, I can't claim to have come up with this myself. However, if you liked me doing this kind of video, please do like and comment and I would love to do more of this kind of thing. You go, Glenn Coco.